So welcome everyone. And um, this is an AppCam lecture series, as we all know, and it is a new competency model learning program that shines a spotlight on the important role of improving problem solving skills, communication, increased focus on technology and innovation, innate technicalities, et cetera. This will be a free online academic conversation conducted monthly by AppCam. The first AppCam lecture was conducted on the topic of case management on the international mediation. The second we had conducted on the investment mediation. And today we are going to discuss Singapore Convention as an aid to commercial world. Highly useful for mediators, mediation advocate, in-house lawyers, and the parties who are involved in the cross-border disputes. For this lecture, we have today with us our vice president of AppCam, Professor Francis Law. He's the president of Hong Kong Mediation Center. Professor Law is the founding chairman of International Dispute Resolution and Risk Management Institute, that is IDRRMI, president of Academy of International Dispute Resolution, Professional Negotiation, that is AIDRN, chairman of Hong Kong International Mediation Center, and the chairman of Hong Kong Center of International Commercial Arbitration, and the past chairman of Asian Mediation Association. Professor Law is an experienced international business consultant and expert in dispute resolution with more than 30 years experience in the industry. He is the lead trainer and the lead assessor of dispute resolution profession, profession in Hong Kong, China, and other Asian countries. He is the adjunct senior lecturer in LLM MA course of Macau University of Science and Technology and City University of Macau and Hang Seng Management College of Hong Kong. Since 2016, he has been appointed as an observer and leading delegations of ancestral meetings. He has been participating actively in the draft of UN mediation conventions and its promotional work. Professor Law was awarded a certificate of commendation by the Secretary of Home Affairs to command for his dedicated service and outstanding contribution to the promotion of mediation professional services. And the list will not going to end so fast. So uh, I welcome you, Professor. Uh, and uh, I think my entire people who has been, who has joined from the various jurisdiction and from the various uh, part of the world and India and Asia, they will be benefit with your session. Over to you, Professor. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, I know that uh, I say congratulations to your new appointment as a director. Of <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Yes, uh, very thank you for your good works, and I'm so excited to have a chance to share with uh, our ACAM members for all the new information about the um, the answer trial new ordinance or uh, convention, and hope that can uh, further promote the uh, use of mediation and that for the dispute resolution around Asia Pacific. Okay, uh, maybe I should start with uh, the PVP at the time. And the PPT will be later on served to uh, ACAM can share among our members. So hope that can help a lot of you to understand more about the new department at all. Yes. So we are going to share. I hope you all uh, can see the, um, the the screen that we share. So there's the, the first series of the ACAM Nature Series. We're talking about Singapore Convention as an aid to the commercial world. Uh, we have talked about this, this topic in different avenues for over a uh, hundred times, actually in past four years time. So it will be in the direction of a professional only, but we go further, we go have to come the commercial or business sector, how to use Singapore Convention to do as a production and enhance their work in the commercial area. So today we have uh, very luckily, we have the ACAM uh, build up the whole collaboration. We have the all members as a supporting and other major Asia international organization on dispute resolution and other to support the UN. Um, there's a simple uh, instruction for more for me and uh, which is uh, so glad here again to work with you on this area. 
So uh, for the A to the commercial world, we can see that there's a four basic the five directions that actually can help. First is the risk management uh, perspective. And the second is dispute resolution. We build for the connection between the dispute parties and also the business partners. We'll have the opportunity for ticket as an opportunity to build a bigger network and also enhance the business and apartment in the Asia, especially for Asia Pacific countries. Oh, well, this old uh, aid to the commercial world that work well. Let me go further on the detail of this one. Well, from the objective of the Singapore Convention is basically and offers an effective, efficient and simple framework for the cross-border enforcement of settlement agreement. It recognized the value of mediation for international trade and it saved the causes in administration of justice. Will work seamlessly in different legal, social and economical system. Help contribution to development harmonious international economy relationship. That is from the objective, we are very clear, it basically fulfill what we expect from the fir first idea or objective as with this uh, convention to ensure the commercial world world. So at the same time, we have to look into more detail about this. It also unify all the concern about the previous, we have the consideration, we have the mediation, and now we all formalize to be mediation. It will help the business to clear up all the previous uncertainty in their contracts, in doing the risk management, doing the clause for this bill resolution, it will have a very, very clear arrangement. It also do some change and make to other trial law on that conciliation will change to mediation. That will be definitely we have a very united arrangement throughout the worldwide business and legal profession. It looks mediation, it shows mediation is widely used terms now in practice. And also this the purpose in our discussion in uh, other trial, that's basically it increased the visibility of this, consider, uh, this convention. The mediation will be more more directly uh, affect or facilitate the business environment in the world. So we will consider that is some risk in international investment or trades. So what we have to consider for the risk or for business and revenue, they will consider seven different type of uh, risk that happen for their business. Political results. Uh, that's very difficult to arrange, but actually they have a very strong face. It's like that right now in the Europe, there's a huge problem in political issues. So compliance, we have different type of um, compliance like AML. We have the Europe standard. We have the Chinese standard. We have that from the Australia and this pirate compliance issue have to be considered. And there are a cultural difference. This all will help and create some kind of barrier for the business doing. And also the legal system also provide and contribute to a lot of uh, change or um, that will prohibit it or that will tend to the development of a business development. Also resources allocation to different sector, financial issues and business environment, they are all risk has to be faced in the process of doing business not only for international, but they also concern for all kinds of commercial. So if difference happen, it will cause a lot of damage to business. So misunderstanding by others, misinterpretation of others' behavior, incapacity of understanding the others' expectation, failure in meeting others' needs, satisfies, uh, satisfactions and failure in achieving their own needs. And these all related to the business entity. And uh, without proper handle this risk, we will cause a lot of loss in the course of business. And lucky enough, using the Singapore Convention as the mediation, as the vehicle, we can further promote the use of mediation. In particular, people have a greater chance of trust. For the, con from the country, actually they will consider, they will have the, opportunity to promote Singapore Convention and rules that active participate include to sign and verify the 
SMCs. That will help to minimize this uncertainty and use as a proper tools to help that to minimize the risk that will happen. That's for the state they have to do. Um, and other thing is the company, including mediation clause, include mediation clause in all agreements. And that will be have a very good approach, especially there's an international support by the Singapore Convention that mediation work well in the business world. And this kind of uh, instruction of the protection uh, the cross or dispute resolution cause use mediation as the first one to handle it will probably provide the most effective way and unarguably can help the business to have a good preparation to prevent cross uh, the, of the, 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 the risk happen. And also development in the understanding of the benefit on using mediation. For most of places we, we meet in the uh, Asia, we found that there's a lot of uh, organization or company, they are not actually understand why and what benefit can gain from mediation. And that is the way that mediation, if you know more about it, we will go further on how they can handle and benefit the organization. And this will particularly helping the uh, benefit for the company to join uh, with the Singapore Convention to promote, use it and help the business department. And they would be good for the staff to have the understanding on mediation as well. They know this system, they are aware, and they have the talent and professional assist in facilitating using this. As a mediator or legal professional, we will have another important role as we can say that. So they will have a clear understanding on SME the requirements, and other alternatives when they deal with mediation or they have to come up with the enforcement issues. How to use a proper case management in mediation can work out better results and develop them themselves, enhance their performance through the learning or becoming a mediation advocate. And this all can actually help to develop the business uh, in doing their dispute resolution and risk management and save the time through the understanding of the Singapore Mediation Convention as well as mediation. Uh, because in this area, we have highlighted the importance of uh, international mediation through the Singapore Convention. This demonstrates is an effective way in handling the difference among parties in different cultures, in practice, in the legal system. They all can work out. But I, I can see a lot of Asia places Actually, they have a deal system in the legal. They have combined legal in different aspects. Islamic law, the local uh, law, or uh, we can say that is the uh, common law or civil law, they are mixed together. They apply in the same country and uh, that happen. And they also see that when we do with the across border, our brothers in other places in Asia and Pacific, they have a different legal system. When we deal with the issues, we cannot rely only on the legal or litigation approach. We have a heavily work with the international mediation service. And so the enforcement of MSA is required by the party in this end. And this particular important for the international mediation uh, and the Singapore Convention to pave the way for the recognition on MSAs. And so this application of international convention or treaty will also benefit to the trading or resolving the dispute right between uh, different places on from different class of the business. So in handling cultural, legal, practice difference in international mediation, they have to facilitate parties to understand the difference through frank exchange among parties because the system about the mediation is trying to link the people together. As we were saying that we are connecting people, we connecting, we connection about the understanding, facilitate a clear understanding in their own limitation, needs and importance, and facilitate a clear understanding of the limitation needs and importance of the others. And this all will facilitate a good understanding and prepare for resolving their spill uh, in case of happening. So this all can facilitate a well won understanding on using the mediation. And the importance of the Singapore Convention will lead to a very important direction 
people will take the international mediation or even the mediation practice to be a very effective way or a competent way in resolving their disputes. We have explained that we now have the different modes in the sense of risk prevention, in the sense of dispute resolution and connecting peoples uh, with the mediation and with the Singapore Convention. So the next step, we have to look into how and why the efficiency of the international mediation is so high that can facilitate within um, our dispute to clear away the dispute among them. This is a model that, def that developed for the purpose of using mediation. And from the root, you have to get a very good understanding that mediation is different from all type, even all type except the negotiation itself. So all type of dispute resolution. Other type of dispute resolution is either trying to stop the argument through the third authority or competent authority. We are thinking about the final results on suppress all the situation. But for mediation, we go further to the root of the dispute. From their psychological concern, their values and other things, we have direct to follow and let them go back to reformulate their expectation and make them in a calm and workable situation to make a right or right decision. You know that all the people will be suffering in a right frustration or other situation when they become exercised or they, they are so nervous or they are in an emotion situation. So what we have to do is let the party to calm down, to make a wise decision at a reasonable manner with objective information they get together. And the mediation whole process is trying to facilitate party to gain on this condition or build an atmosphere for them to negotiate. So from the fundamental, we change, we help them to reveal their position, to think about the original thinking, what their now position is not necessary, to be the only choice they can do, and the position is not necessary to be the only way to handle the situation. And in most situations, the position is not the effective way to net their needs to be achieved or satisfied. So go further in this area, we have to design for the mediation with competed or we have to compare with the convention to provide a very clear fold for doing the international mediation under the umbrella of the international standard and also from individual place that work well in the mediation practice. In a simple way, we can say that when we take a case, when we have the dispute, so when a mediator or mediation organization take the case, they have to first to do case analysis. That is the case evaluation, whether it is good or not, suitable or not. <laughs> Okay, so another thing is when we clarify they are suitable and should use mediation, we will continue to communicate with parties. To know the communication is not the superficial one, but we have to know about their concerns, their thinking, their expectation, and their rational behind. Together with this information, we try to formulate a mediation strategy and logistics that will help the party to get to into the mode for resolving that dispute. So formally, the message of the mass of the mediation strategy and logistics will help the party in prepare themselves for the mediation and also for the mediator to work well in the mediation section. After completing this stage, we go directly to the facilitate effective negotiation, that is the mediation section. By then, the party communicate directly with the assistant from the mediator to let them clear understand the opposite side or the other side's idea, the needs, the concerns, 
and also need to facilitate to, for them to satisfy their need. They will develop the expectation to work with each other, will build the best returns through the process. So that will be the very good reason for them to collaborate and do the things to maximize their return for resolving this dispute. But mediation is like all kinds of uh, dispute resolution, especially it is very, very important in about the skill set and the system provide. We at most can do around 60 to 70% of settlement rate. So if the case settled, we have to follow up action for the enforcement. Particular, if in some places, settlement agreement is not accepted directly, like in China, like in some other Asia places, they have to go to the court to make an endorsement. Uh, or if they are going to cross border, they have to go for an international enforcement approach that is go back to whether it's applicable to the Singapore Convention. And then for the cases is not settled, the mediator or mediation organization have to advise their client, the parties, what to do next, because they still remain has that dispute. But if they have not settled through the mediation, it's quite natural because we still remain 30% of the cases is not unable to settle in the first round of mediation. They can choose to do an round of mediation. They can also opt to use the other convention like uh, arbitration or go to the court. But for sure, even when the case, you go to the other approach for resolving the dispute, if you are doing the mediation right and in professional way, actually a lot of minor dispute or uncertainty has been cleared by the process. And when their work go further for litigation or arbitration, a lot of minor dispute has been settled and noted to trace further. So the overall process will also remain, reduce the overall process for doing that. And most important is that through the process, the anonymity among party will have an effective control. They will suppress of all, a lot of uh, dispute happen in the process because of the understanding gain and unclear about the motive or the needs of both sides. And then we go further is about understand these forces, why they are important, why they can work out. And then we go back to the Singapore Convention because we have to know how they can work well and bring the benefit. So Singapore Convention is a very special one. They go further for the enactment and investment of the foreign judgment of what settlement or settlement agreement. Right now in the International Avenue, we have three vehicles. One is for, through the hate convention for the uh, litigation judgment, and one for the arbitration convention, that's a New York convention, that is the enforcement of foreign arbitral awards. And finally, we have the Singapore Mediation Convention. We have the full name is United Nations Convention on International Settlement Agreements Resulting from, Sing from Mediation, that is Singapore Mediation Convention. So this will be the career. We go for different direction if we come up with the result. And this is a basic understand. We are all legal professionals, so we will be very understand that the arbitration has been for over six years in a very effective way in rules resolving this bill. And up to 2022 August, we have 170 uh, states has been signed and ratified uh, the New York Convention. So it's the most powerful one up to the moment. And then before that, they have no international convention. So there are a lot of international trade on investment is not effectively handled. And for the Hague Convention, it remains to be a, a traditional way on thinking, doing uh, litigation and then get the court result being by the conference uh, the Hague Conference to work out in different places to enforce it. There's over 68 uh, members right now. They are one of the way to recognize the foreign uh, judgment, but they have a lot of restriction or requirement before they can use this apply to the Hague Convention or the, this uh, enforcement uh, arrangement. So, the most important now we can see it is in different ways as mentioned that Singapore Convention become a very unique way to facilitate mediation settlement agreement that can enforceable in other places. 
we have a lot of uh, supporting regulations and admins and rules which supporting the right way, way of doing the mediation with the maximum result. Uh, this is some we have discussed through 2014 to 2018. Well, in the other child working group number two, to make all the understanding on the international standard for this kind of uh, mediation settlement agreement for the um, uh, agreed uh, between these places. So we have a very good result. Uh, up to now, we have already 10 states ratified by the Singapore mediation or on the Singapore Convention. And the signing signatory country over 58 together, and it covered, uh, I mean, the population of the world, over 53% of the world population uh, countries has been signed the Singapore Convention. You can see the world acceptance is really high, and it will be provide a very good standing for people are looking forward to have the opportunity to use mediation after settlement cleared this bill for why the platform for them to work a better deal with other places. So we look further into the Singapore Convention, we will have two scope of the application. It applies directly to be a commercial with work in the international aspect for the cross border. So it is talking about in different countries. But in the same country, we cannot use the Singapore Convention with the same country where domestic mediation that governed by the local law only, not by the Singapore Convention. So, and the second one is we have the expansion, right, uh, the place where the, we have considered the place to do the dispute at the time of the settlement. And then we have the concern about the area on the uh, work related is for business and not for other things. And for place of business that we'll be talking about, it will concern only on the place of business. This may be, you can see that like uh, the habitual residence or performance of works, they consider the place with different place. Suppose you have a, a branch office, then the branch office in Korea and one branch office is in Thailand. So that is completely, satisfied with the requirement on the international aspect, even though you are come from the same organization principle, but they are business in different places. Okay, so they have a clear and very objective way in doing the business. They have a, another way as a, some other issue is not applicable for the convention. Some personal family, or we can say inheritance and employment matter is not applicable for the Singapore Convention. And we have to particular attention for that. So Singapore Convention is confined to business for international, but not other type of this bill. So this is another way we have to particular attention for is something or some kind of settlement agreement is also not workable under the convention is they have already approved by the court or concluded in the course of proceeding before the court. That is with the judgment. So that is not workable or not applicable for the Singapore Convention. Other type is whether the case has been, the settlement agreement has been recalled or enforceable as an arbitral award that we convert into a arbitral award. And that is not necessary to use the Singapore Convention to uh, applied on it because we have to identify or separate different conventions to take care of different type of dispute resolution approaches and it will be a very important part that the government of the Singapore Convention say that is only focused on mediation matters. Uh, and other we, way we have to take particular attention for is about the requirement for the settlement agreement. It will consider in different from local cases. In local cases, domestic cases, we do not require the mediator to sign on the settlement agreement. Uh, we no need to demonstrate that with the organization that will be having to complete the mediation settlement agreement through a mediation. But for the Singapore Convention, we have a very strict 
uh, requirement under its Article 4, you have to demonstrate that there are real mediation have gone through before you come up with this settlement agreement. So that will be have the evidence to show that there is a proper mediation case completed. So the mediator signature is required and the mediator will be uh, from the organization will do the test, uh, testify that they are act attest by the organization that's administered this mediation. And if something still cannot be working out, the court of the final working phases, they will decide any evidence acceptable to the authority, that is the court. They agree with the kind, this kind of evidence, showing that this real mediation has been completed. In this aspect, we can see that they divided from our original thinking. Uh, mediation now come to a more institutional approach. That is, an institution can back up and support the mediation process. In these cases, the mediation institute will assist to attestation of the uh, mediation settlement agreement, and they will provide with a clear process in management of the whole cases. In also, when they are having the translation or other professional involvement, the institute have to be taken off. And most importantly, about the rules and regulation, uh, mediation institutes can enforce and uh, regulate. But if you are still work on individual mediators, that's still acceptable, but you have to go through a very strict requirement to demonstrate the mediation has been complete properly according to the rules of the answer trial. And also they have come a match with the Singapore Convention requirement. Uh, another thing we have to know this about reasons for uh, course set aside or refuse to grant the leave to the application of the Singapore second, I mean the settlement agreement. It is a uh, very common sense in both the court, they are if the agreement is loud and void or not binding or have been replaced, something removed, the settlement is not the final one. And in that case, the court will refuse to grant the leave on that. And also with the settlement agreement actually has been performed, it, or the uh, content is not clear, presented, it's not really workable, so the court will refuse to grant the relief. Uh, and also, if that is really clear, that settlement agreement terms is contradict with the application of how to grant the relief, that the court will also refuse to grant relief as well. But the E part and F part will be a very important for the petitioner in mediators and institutes to take care of because they will have to call two important calls for that is the serious speech of mediator and mediation standard. That is will have to jeopardize the value or the whether the settlement agreement is applicable or voidable. And on the same case, if there's serious conflict of interest of mediator, if known an agreement would not have been reached, that is to say, if they come up with an agreement that the mediator have some conflict of interest and the agreement by the time of signing the agreement, the party doesn't know this kind of conflict of interest. And, but if the, the party know that's the conflict, they will not sign this kind of settlement agreement. And in that case, they cannot, I mean the court will, will not grant relief on that. So what we say that is basically there's a very important issue is that Singapore Convention has provided a very good platform for commercial sectors to settle their dispute and make the prevention. But at the same time, they are very strict restriction on application of a mediation convention. That means they read the use for cross-border recognition. So they have other way to handle. So the organization under the ACM uh, Alliance will be having the weight of the model in handling different type of uh, cases. In case mediation, single convention is workable. So they will have the way to use like here. You can see that from the path in the middle part, they will do the attesting with the IMS HKMC's attestation to fulfill the requirement of Singapore Mediation Convention and submit to the Court of Secretary of States. And then if they are not applicable, 
they will root for some kind of arbitration conversion, or if they go in mainland or other places, they will go to the court to get the endorsement. And another way you can see the very right one that is talking about submit the case settlement agreement for notarization. That is some places it is workable for the notarization of the settlement agreement as a proof to make it workable in other jurisdictions. And that is uh, some way we can right, do right now. So we cater for some non-applicable cases and way forward for a sister party to resolve the dispute. As mentioned that we have the met up that is talking about after mediation is still not, uh, it is not applicable because they are single convention is not workable. So they will change to arbitration award that will not going back to use the Singapore Convention, but they have a lot of work to assure the process can be working out through this mechanism about the reputation and about the control of the, all the relevant evidence and supporting documents. Mediation litigation as mentioned, it, it will do the settlement agreement and then submit to the court. The court seeing any no ultra or effect or you not uh, necessary to be any kind of jeopardize or against the local jurisdiction or laws, they will send out a judgment, consent uh, judgment that made the uh, mediation settlement agreement workable. Like China, uh, they are using this approach. And finally, it's the middle, mid and a notary. That is what was said, use the notary system to help to ratify the settlement agreement. The process is some kind of process have a very clear proceeding on using this international mediation process applied on it. On each of part, they have a proper calculation on the fee, the charges, and the time to work it out, and the way for conversion. And if they are workable or they are settled or not settable, they have the direction of using the uh, conversion approach. And for Atkins centers, let me have the time to introduce our service. Well, Atkins centers, including nine centers right now, we provide the best solution to all business. We have a well as disrupted international mediation mechanism and well established mediation rules and quality assurance system. So in the right hand, you can see the ACM mediation rules, which is comparable and work well with the Singapore mediation rules on mediation. We have a large number of mediation experts participated in developing the Singapore Mediation Convention and other petitional, other way of participation. They are uh, attending the, uh, the uh, working group and discussion about the important issue concern about Singapore Convention. So they are so familiar with the whole system. High quality certified mediator, mediation advocates and mitigation case management. They will provide a true comprehensive support and all the certified mediator and advocates and the case manager will have the recognition, uh, apply proper training and clarified by outcome system. And comprehensive system for enforcement of mediated settlement agreement and other resolution. Mediation centers uh, of the act will go further for the enforcement issue and support the whole process. Make sure the process is enforceable and will not deviate from the routine process. And also if they are not applicable for the Singapore Convention, they will direct the party using the right approach to serve it. It is crucial of major mediation and arbitration center in the Asia Pacific with aviation in America and Europe. This all will provide a very big international web to help our mediators, our business to finish their dispute or complete their dispute, even with the, those in the Europe and the American. They are familiar with diversified culture, legal and business practice across the world. So this will, will attribute to the outcomes centers in doing their expertise in using mediation or international mediation to solve the dispute, especially for commercial disputes. And uh, basically it's talking about our 
uh, discussion at time. Our presentation is right here. Uh, I will be very appreciate to have your questions. You may send your question through the chat room and we will try to answer you direct in this uh, 10 minutes time. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Law. So it's been a very, very comprehensive, a very insightful session. I may say that on the started from the mediation understanding and the international mediation, and you have linked it very nicely with the use of uh, Singapore Convention in the commercial world. So um, I have got a few questions for you uh, by the participants. So I have uh, Professor Sharma. He raised his hand. So we yeah, he was clapping. I think. <laughs> Uh, I okay. was clapping. I was clapping. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah, please, uh, Iram. Any question? Yeah, we we I have received uh, uh, four or five questions from the participants. So if uh, the uh, this uh, can be closed, so it will be easier for everyone to this page be closed. Okay. Yeah. The first question is that uh, can the non-signatory countries? Uh, in those countries, can we can we have a seat for mediation? Is it any problem if the non-signatory, if we make the seat for the mediation, for conduct of the mediation? Well, basically, uh, for under the mediation concept or the Singapore Convention, there's no seat concern. Actually, this uh, arbitration concern on the seat. So that is just what we are saying that uh, even for the non-signatory, uh, places coming in if they want to use Singapore Convention, it will be put or urging the government to join the Singapore Convention secretary and ratify it through a formal system. Or otherwise, they are not uh, benefited by the Singapore Convention. So you mean to say it is different from the arbitration with regard to the seat? It is non-citus, and uh, in arbitration, we need to see the seat whether the seat is also the signatory for the New York Convention, and that is not the case in mediation. Mm. So the, the problem is that for the place we are going to do the mediation, it's not uh, necessary to be only thing we concerned, but the, uh, I mean the countries of the business, whether they, their country has been signed or ratified, Singapore Convention is the key of concern. Uh, Dr. Lo, can we reduce the, uh, can we stop the screen sharing so that... Uh... Oh yeah, sure. i stop this first. Thank you so much. And the second question is, in case of the multi-party mediation in the cross-border, so if there are, there are let's say, uh, 10 or 12 parties and one or two party missed to sign the uh, settlement agreement, so in that condition, will it be uh, excluded from the or refused for the enforcement? Well, or will it, it be con considered to be the concluded settlement agreement or not? Well, that's pretty flexible. If some kind, say, it involves six, 12 different places, for using and all they are qualified and applicable for a Singapore Convention. And the second system of agreement uh, have been uh, worked out, but only two of them has not signed. Well, we will recommend ask them to sign definitely, but if they are not going to sign, that will become the agreement between all 10 remaining uh, states, not involving the two having signed the states. Okay, so it will be uh, uh, it will be binding on those states who has who has signed it only, not yeah. the person who. Has... Well, yes, the basic they understand for the settlement agreement is an agreement. All signed it will be involved. Non-sided party is not basically uh, should be the stakeholder of the uh, agreement. Okay, thank you so much, Doctor Lo. There is one more question that uh, this is regarding Article Five E. So uh, here is the question that can you give an example of 5e which contain, which says that the serious breach of mediation mediator and the mediation um, standard so what what is the example for this well for 5d is talking about they have uh well Arcetra has been doing very good they have also the code of conducts and other things working out so it's easy to reference what to do and most likely they will rely on the organization, this mediation institutes in their domestic countries to control over the performance of the mediator. Well, for example, in our understanding, if they have disclosed about the information for this uh, settlement agreement, which is prohibited in all kind of uh, mediation process. So if they disclose the information whereby they should not disclose, there's a breach of confidentiality. 
and definitely is a very serious breach of their uh, conduct or their performance. And for the other one is a serious uh, conflict of interest or the interest cell happen. Maybe we can say one of the happen situation is being the mediator, being one party's shareholder, if they are a lease the company. So if they don't disclose this information and finally people on the both sides recognize after that, they will be have the argument because actually the mediator have the um, it, uh, conflict of interest because he is being the uh, shareholder of one of the party. So that will be seriously jeopardized their neutrality. And that will happen, they have a good reason for that they are not going to enforce it. They refuse to give the leave as that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Doctor. Now we have another question is uh, the it is the follow up question of the non signatory uh, parties. Uh, so uh, there is a follow up question of that uh, from that question only that if non signed party has acknowledged the same by electronic or verbal communication, will that be uh, good for the enforcement? Uh, well, they have included all electronic signature and other means they are recognized by the convention as well. No need to be physically signed it, but they have the other provision to concern. They are the January of their signature is true. They have the other system to protect it about their, their rights as not being forced by other people. Thank you. And <laughs> there are a lot of questions for you. So other oh. question is what would be the enforceability procedure entails for non-signatory countries? So. <laughs> well, well, if they are not non-signatory or not ratified ready, so they are not actually involved. But for the signatory country, they have the one strong good is they can opt out. That means uh, we cannot be a non-signatory or non-ratified country to get involved. But as a signatory or ratified country, they will have uh, another issue they can consider opt out in particular cases. So that will facilitate. I mean, the feasibility we give to this um, verified country. And another question is uh, that how how we can propagate it amongst the stakeholders? Pop promotion to other stakeholders, you mean? Yes. Other states? Oh, yeah. So uh, I think that will be a duty of ACM. So we're trying to... <laughs> Trying to promote that cross border Asia Pacific. In fact, we have been doing very successfully among these spaces. We continue doing this kind of lecture with your good leadership. And also, we will have a lot of uh, work to do with uh, deal with the government, especially there's a lot of, even not for a single convention, the investor state or state to state this bill actually can do with the international mediation. And we have a very good news, actually. Hong Kong will set up an international mediation uh, institute that is uh, run by the uh, PRC government. So they will be having the alignment with a lot of Asia and Belt Road countries for using this system, using mediation to resolve their state disputes. Well, that will be a very, very uh, amazing approach and we look forward to have that uh, further development. Thank you. Uh, one last question. I know that there are a lot of questions you are loaded with. So the, um, you have mentioned about the notarization that in, in, the, in the Hong Kong jurisdiction, there is a method of notarization as well. So there is a question related to that, that will not be a, a breach of confidentiality or how you maintain the confidentiality in that circumstances when the entire settlement agreement will go for the notarization. Oh yeah, so basically the organization, the arbitration, they do have the same issue. Well, they have to have a working committee, most sophisticated uh, association should do this thing because they have to ensure the quality of the performance of the mediator and also the um, settlement agreement. The organization have their duty like the lawyer to serve their clients. They got the privilege in doing the code of conduct as well. So for the mediation institutes, they have even tightened code of quarter. They have to uh, apply for and they have to uh, uh, operate, advocate. That will be protecting the party's interests. But if they don't have the chance to put this case or the settlement agreement being scrutinized by the uh, authority or the organization, they cannot really satisfy the need of the Singapore Convention. They must 
have a competent authority to demonstrate they really work a mediation. So that will be a easier way for the organization to do the attestation, but they have to look into the settlement agreement is fair, protecting the uh, properly performed it, and that not jeopardize uh, either party's interest. Thank you so much. Uh, so now we, we have uh, no more questions. So uh, in this, if uh, Dr. Sharma, uh, if you would like to add something in the end, would love to hear you also. <laughs> No, I mean, uh, Dr. Law has already covered quite a lot, nothing to add. The only thing is that all the participants, the only one request we have is that uh, your presence here really shows your interest in knowing more about the Singapore Convention. And uh, as an user, it is a new document. As a young lawyer, it's a new uh, area which is coming. As a mediator, you have more a scope to now use this one. So I will just say that grab this opportunity, learn about more, know about more, and uh, sooner or later, or even now, you have to use it. And even you are in your own country, don't think that the Singapore Convention is only applies when the two countries are there. Yes, that's the definition is there. But many times, you will be surprised that you are dealing with the two parties, but the outcome of the mediation may have a cross-border impact. Like two businesses in India, they are doing a joint project in Nepal, and they are talking about they have a mediation over that. So therefore, it will come under the international, it will become international mediation, even if the two parties are from India. And therefore it is international and therefore the Singapore Convention will apply. So this is very important. And the one part which uh, Dr. Law has already um, answered, and this is basically all arbitration lawyers and the, and the lawyer himself or herself has this problem of getting over with the concept of seat. They always say location, seat, country, where is the place of mediation? The interesting part is that forget about that. For mediation, it is not important to find out where the mediation was conducted. Like in this online forum, we are con if we conduct mediation, there cannot be any place, any country. What is more important for you to think about it? Where you are going to enforce your settlement agreement resulting from mediation? Just think about that country. If that country is a signatory to New York con uh, to Singapore Convention, you are well covered. So even if your country has not signed yet, and if your country has not ratified it, it's okay, no problem. As long as where you are going to enforce the settlement agreement, they have signed, they have ratified, and the process in place, you can enforce it. For example, if you are Indian businessman and you have a mediation against the Singapore party, and you, are the, uh, you have an agreement to enforce in Singapore. Now Singapore has signed it, ratified it. There's a process in place. You just go to the court and your agreement will directly be enforced. No question asked. Court will not ask you why you have agreed for $5 million as a settlement. They will not question like an arbitration award. They will just see what they have to do and they will just enforce it. So these are the minor, these are the couple of important things, which is very different than the arbitration, which you are used to of it, very different than the litigation we, you are used to of it. So this is different and you keep in mind. And this is very important. Another thing to remember, very basic thing is the mediation settlement agreement. Everybody will tell you it's like a contract. Actually, it's not. It's not a contract itself. It's a resolution of a dispute. It's an agreement in that sense. So therefore, if this one piece of paper which you are agreeing to, it can be enforced directly and no question will be asked. Even unconscionability will not be asked. Unreasonableness question will not be asked. The court cannot go into the merit of that agreement. So this is the power and this is the future you have now. So I think the young or the future mediators and lawyers and the parties and the users are in a much better position uh, that what we as an old experts or the old people have seen it. So the future is with you. Okay. So thank you very much. That's the only simple uh, point. Dr. Rajesh for this uh, intervention. And uh, I would like to uh, uh, say that in that condition that uh, Singapore or international mediation with the help of Singapore Convention is useful even for the signatory and the non-signatory equally. Like you have a scope to uh, build your career and uh, in, in, in mediation. So Professor uh, Law, just in the end, I would like to know that, can you, can you give two or three tips to 
um, to the young, uh, you know, uh, aspirant into mediation that how they can build their career into this field internationally. Uh -huh. I think this, uh, thank you. Yeah, I, I think it's very important as a, a young lawyer or a young professional joining the field of dispute resolution. Knowing the Singapore Convention is a very good way for them to uh, achieve a better development in the future. But not only the Singapore Convention actually have a very high standard or arrangement and the concept of mediation. When they use the same standard back to the domestic area, they can apply well. Uh, not necessary to be must have an international cases, then they can use the spirit of mediation. When in fact, mediation being a very common weight of dispute resolution. And also being the advocate of mediation will be in a long run have a better return than just doing a litigation case lawyer. Because the return, you will have a better imagination as what we discussed in the class that the advocate for mediation have a good contribution for the cases and they do have a very good return at the end. And finally is uh, get more chance to get involved in the professional organizations. They have the sharing, they have the exposure, go to international. Like Dr. Iram, you've been working <laughs> on international organization and joining. So we've been happy to see a lot of uh, new lawyers, young lawyers, young fellows to join our team to work out as a professional dispute resolution like mediator or arbitrator as well. This looks like a small capacity building of a session, you know, it, everybody is benefited with your knowledge and uh, with your expertise into this field. And uh, thank you so much for sparing your time, especially on the Saturday and being with us on this technical session. Thank you so much, uh, okay. Dr. Rajesh Sharma also. And thank you so much all the participants who are attending this session, despite of Saturday. This, this, is, this is an endeavor, endeavor for all of you and you should get the benefit of these kind of sessions. So we'll be coming back in December with another technical session. And um, uh, I have shared the link also, if you want to get the PPTs, Etc. So uh, we'll get uh, details from you. And uh, thank you so much for joining. And uh, thank you. Okay. So thank much, you. everyone. Thank you. Bye bye. bye.